to God. So next. And guess what? You yourself know. I mean, if you look at your smartphone and you're honest with yourself, there's maybe 10 apps you use regularly. And maybe if you're an intense gamer, there may be four or five more that you, you use for gaming. But outside of that, your loyalty to apps is very low. In fact, most people I have surveyed, it's not more than five apps outside of the utility apps. So very hard to get loyalty. That's another thing you should keep in mind. Last, keep going. And scaling is hard, but this is, you know, very few companies can achieve a WhatsApp. I, I hear from lots of entrepreneurs, uh, I want to build the next WhatsApp, and that's great, but just be aware that it's very hard in the mobile space to really build a winner. Obviously, a winner, uh, the last thing, if you can win, it's disproportionate. That's why WhatsApp, and you know, last uh, uh, May I was in their offices, and they're like 50 people. And here they are, $19 billion, 50 people company. Most companies of $19 billion in market cap have tens of thousands of employees. Here are just 50 people. It's literally a room not bigger than this. Whole hall, for the whole company. And it's quite lavish, the, room, the offices and everything, right? Because, you know, they just, they've been created this winning product, right? That is, and winning is disproportionate. So, next. So two other areas, and these are not so much inflections as two areas I'd urge you to really think through investing your time in. If you're a, not an engineer per se, and you're not, or you're an engineer, but you're not looking at becoming, you know, on uh, joining, jumping in on the technical side of things, is digital marketing, and I'm saying it very broadly, is understanding how the digital world works for marketing and sales, it's a metrics-driven world. There's science and there's an art to it, both combined. And so if you can learn that, it would be very valuable going forward. It's highly underrated. It's almost non-existent in all our curriculum. In fact, most of the companies need people who are competent in this. And if you're a super expert, you would be extremely valuable and highly desired if you could do this well. Because digital marketing is morphing every six months to 12 months. You know, it's, like I said, a combination of science and art. And I think this is where, if we could get the right people together, this is a winning career path, okay? The next, design. And I don't mean cosmetic Photoshop design. I mean interaction design, user interaction design. You, and then the experience design. This is another huge path, and often ignored. There are very few design schools in India. In fact, most of the engineering teams I talk to, guess what they need? What is the ideal mix? It's one designer who's going to own the experience. It's one growth hacker or a marketing digital marketing person. It's a product manager slash engineer, and it's a couple, two to three engineers. That's the ideal six-person team. And guess what? We just don't have those two other buckets of people. We don't have talent in those two other buckets, which is the design and the previous one, which is digital marketing. The last one where we start to see some need is, again, some data analytics, a data scientist on these teams. These are areas of opportunity for those of you who are not wanting to go straight into building a, a software product or an engineering product, right? These are areas that are critical going forward and where you could have extremely valuable uh, careers. Next. So I'll just give you two or three slides on the Indian ecosystem now. Just to give you a sense of where we are as an ecosystem. Uh, I won't bore you with too much statistics, just a couple of slides. Next. Next. So, you know, in numeric terms, outside of the US, almost, and China, almost no other startup ecosystem will matter, with the one exception of Israel. Israel is a very outward focused uh, ecosystem. They do fantastic companies, and we have a lot to learn from Israel. But the, the two biggest other ones are going to be China and US. China is very much its own 
a very walled garden. Uh, but US, India are going to be the two big ecosystems going forward because of just the scale. It'll be very hard for us in the near term to catch up with Silicon Valley, and we need not aspire for that necessarily. But here are some of the statistics. <coughs> I'll let you read that. It's, it's third place now. We've got all these numbers are dated because all of these numbers are growing faster than uh, by every month. They're all expanding. Okay, let me stay a little bit on this slide just to explain to you where the three silos of opportunity generally are. You can build products, and these are, if you were thinking of building something or being a company, you have to decide which of these three areas you are supporting. There's a fourth, which is social, which I don't have on this slide, and which is a very honorable thing to go do as well. I'm addressing more the commercial opportunities, okay? So you have large companies. You can sell to large companies. You can sell to SMBs. Uh, or you can sell to directly to consumers. These are web commerce, you know, direct retail, whatever it is, you're just serving consumers directly, okay? These are the three big silos. You have to think through what kind of business you are. The one, obviously large enterprises, very hard to get into, you need lots of money. You need to think through what kind of business you can build there. But the two opportunities that are available to everybody, even to bootstrap, are SMBs. Can you solve some problem for an SMB? What is an SMB? A small to medium business. It could be a barber shop, it could be a salon, it could be a kirana store, it could be a doctor's office. If you can solve that problem, the beauty is most of the others in that segment look almost identical especially in a region. So then you have scale available to you if you can truly solve the problem for a, a set of people in that segment. So if you're thinking, hey, I know what I can solve for dentist's office. They need this kind of supply or they, they could use better, uh, you know, some item or I can provide them this service. Great, go find 10 dentist's office, go work with them, make a plan, understand their needs well, try to figure out what it is you'll offer them and then scale that out. That's the opportunity in SMB. Sorry. Let's go next slide. Okay, I'm gonna share with you some of the innovation models we've seen, just to give you again a sense of some of the different ways in which India's innovators are innovating. And these are practical examples that I hope some of you have seen. Next. Yeah, so this is called global innovation. This is innovation that is started locally but then going global, okay? Next. This is the Mahindra Reva car. It started out here in Bangalore, is now being sold globally. <coughs> Next. Just keep going. So this is a car that's actually selling very well across the world. It has an iPhone app that starts it up. Next, one last slide. Yeah, thanks, stop there. So it has, you know, an iPhone app that starts it up. It can be used as a UPS and a generator for your house when in the night. It has its own charging capability in, in, in terms of the, the solar panel that comes on top of the car at home. That's a unique one. Whenever I show that to people, and I've shown it to folks across the world, they're like, okay, you've got an electric car coming out of India, but you also have, it's a gen set at the night, and it it's also has to be charged uh, from solar all, all in one, right? Most electric car companies in the world, guess what? They just assume the grid is there. That you can just plug in at office, you can plug in at work. We have to solve problems differently here in India. So I, I, I show you this not because electric cars are unique, not because you haven't heard of the Mahindra of Reva, but because you have to see how they solve the problem. On the one hand, they have an iPhone app. With the click of a button, you can start the car. But on the other hand, they've actually solved some really Indian problems that are very unique to India. And that's the way you have to approach every problem, I think. You can't just build a car that competes with XYZ that you've seen in Europe or a smart car from Japan. It won't work in India necessarily. Next. Frugal innovation. This is another area. So I showed you global, local that bent global. That's global innovation. Let's talk about frugal innovation. Next. So this is a, a just build it out. One more, one more, one more, one more. Ah, stop there. So here's, a, 
you know, an eye clinic. And, you know, this is essentially the Arvind Eye Clinic. And see all those people in line out there? They're all going to have an operation that day. They're not lining up to go into some stadium to watch some play or, or, or thing. They're all lining up to have an eye operation that day. Now that is scale. When I showed it to somebody who came in from a very large healthcare company, they asked me to expand that slide. I wanted to see how many people would go through that day. And these aren't people who are going to visit. The, these are actually the patients waiting outside. And that's how they're operating on them above. It's a precision. And guess what? They couldn't be doing a hash job on eye jobs, okay? Because if every day they, 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 they did a bad job with that many people, I can guarantee you, nobody would be lined up the next day, right? So they actually have to do it very high quality. This is the basic constraints of India. Resource constraints, which is I can't spend a lot, I don't have a lot of money, I don't have a lot of uh, resources available. A harsh environment, which is, it's going to be dusty, the power may spike, extreme scale needed. There may be skills gaps, which is, not everybody's gonna be fully trained, not everybody may know how to use a product, so you gotta make the product easy to use, and it's gotta be affordable. These are the basic constraints, so if you're thinking of again, what kind of product to build, these are some of the things you need to think through. Next. I'll just quickly flip through this, core innovation, yep, go ahead. Next, last. So there are some core innovations happening as well. So you'll see some companies here that are building their medical devices. There's the Aadhaar project that has really innovated on digital identity. Uh, there are pro companies that are building small little devices, IoT devices that go into fishery pools that measure pH and keep the temperature right and keep the, the alkalinity, alkalinity of the water right, all of that. And these are being very uh, innovated out of India and are very innovative solutions that will now go global. Uh, there's a company in Mumbai that's doing carbon capture that actually uh, won an RFP that is a request for proposal from the European Union. And they competed against lots and lots of companies from around the world and they won it, and they won some 25 uh, million pounds from the UK government to help the UK government in its carbon capture requirements for power plants in UK and, and Europe. So there's just stuff like this happening across the board that shows that you know we can innovate out of India, build things that others want. If we just get the right people in the room uh, together, we put the right resources behind it and give the right nurturing, right? Next. So I'll, uh, I, I'll end with two other sets of slides. One is, where do I see the opportunities going forward? And I call it as the 1% opportunities and the 10x opportunities, okay? And I'll talk about both. And then I'll give you three, uh, you know, examples of just, you know, inspiring examples that I've seen around the world, right? 1%, next. You know, you're gonna uh, reimagine, in the, in the, this, this comes in the 10x category. You're gonna be able to reimagine whole industries. So if it's transport, education, housing, healthcare, they're all gonna look different. You know, last night I was with one of the big builders here in Bangalore, and they were just showing me some of the plans. And the houses you're going to see here in India are like super smart. They're actually trying to do leapfrog. If you think we're going from, you know, no phone to 4G, Guess what? We're going to go to the smartest homes on the planet sometime soon. Because some of our houses cost more than most houses anywhere in the world. So they have to make them really, really smart to be able to sell them for that much, okay? So they're thinking out of the box in terms of what they'll put. So housing is getting really smart. You know, all our education area is an area where you could have ultimate innovation happen as well. Next, I'll show you a 1% opportunity now. So this is in Korea, where Korea is full of Samsung plants. And Samsung has you know, big trucks that come and pick up all the LCDs and LEDs and all that that are leaving their plants. And, but uh, Korea is full of roads that are one way each way. And what would happen is, cars would pop out from behind this truck and get hit. And they would have fatalities. And what the uh, Samsung finally decided to do was say, okay, you know, we're having too many accidents. 
that don't involve our trucks. Our trucks are going the right speed. They're actually not disobeying the law or anything. And in fact, if they slow down, they may even cause more accidents. But the problem is the person behind the truck is so impatient, they want to go beyond the speed limit. They pop over the median, that is the center line, and before they know it, something else hits them. How do we solve that problem? So this is a 1% problem. It's not even a 1% problem for Samsung, really, OK? It's just they, were, they, they, they looked at it as an opportunity to fix something that was involving their trucks. And so they put a camera on the front. And they took big, their four big LCDs, and they strapped it to the back of every one of their trucks. So now, when you're driving in Korea, and you you're go past one of these trucks, you can actually see what's in front of the truck. So you can see the road in front of the truck. So that on the back of the truck is the road in front of the truck. So you as the, as the driver driving behind the truck can actually have a good view of the front, you know? So this is like a 1% opportunity for Samsung. Clearly it reduces a lot of their liabilities, a lot of the issues that they have with their trucks. But it's an example of how to think out of the box with something that exists. Cameras existed, LCDs existed. It's a use case. Obviously Samsung can afford to put LEDs on the back of trucks. They make them, but nevertheless, it's a very innovative kind of way of thinking. Next. Here's where I think, you know, we could do leapfrog opportunities as well. You know, I fly around the country a lot, and, you know, some of our airports, and in fact, I would say more than uh, 20 of them are now modernized and brand new across India, okay? And every time I land, I say, wow, fantastic, you know, India has some of the best airports now, right? But then when you go on the tarmac, you actually see quite a bit of chaos, even at the latest, newest airports, because you'll see buses here, you'll see things parked all over, you'll see people walking around. I don't know if you all heard the news of, you know, some bus driver just fell asleep on the tarmac and dro drove into a jet on, on, at the airport. Now, how does things like that happen, right? And for me, you know, we had a huge opportunity. We could have made India's airports completely autonomous. I know you have all heard of the autonomous car from Google and others and Tesla and all that, but you know those are interesting problems because autonomous cars need to live with legacy. That is, they need to live alongside people who are driving regular cars. So when you put an autonomous car in an environment that is full of regular cars, the autonomous car is not going to do anything. Problem is, others are going to do things to the autonomous car, more likely than not. And the autonomous car has to actually be so smart to take into account all the other crazy drivers around it, right? Who might bump into it, who might break suddenly, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the pedestrians who might walk onto the road, the dog that might come out, the cow that might come out, right? All that. So now an autonomous car has to have radars, it has to have sensing data, it has to have a supercomputer on board. You know, that's great. Awesome. And, you know, and that's why an autonomous car project is interesting. It gets very boring if everything is autonomous. Because that's like a, a, a child's a, a, you know, a train set that goes round and round, right? You know what's happening, everything is coordinated. Guess what? That's what we needed at airports. You know, in India, we could have built autonomous airports where every single vehicle on the tarmac was autonomous. Because the airport is the most protected piece of land in the country, in any city for sure. Everything is defined, it's highly controlled, and the beauty of it is had we done it for the 20 airports we built for, we could have exported to every airport in the world for one simple reason. Airports are standardized. How an aircraft comes and couples with the aero bridge, how traffic how works, how baggage works, how tickets work are standardized across the world. There are hundreds of airports we could have exported that software to those systems to instantly had we done that. And you know, so I see lost opportunity there, but like this, there are 50 other opportunities happening in India. People are building infrastructure of all kinds, hospitals, schools, roads, bridges, you know, software, various kinds, where this opportunity exists. To do something that is awesome for the present and for the local, that will also be amazing and scalable and global in the future. So, you know, just to give kind of food for thought for what might be, it had, had we taken advantage of here in, in a building an autonomous smart airport. Next. So I'm going to end with three examples. Uh, 
you know, the first one is reimagining design. And just to give you a feel for why design is very important going forward. Next. So, you know, what is agile, fast, and beautifully designed? Next. So this is the Ferrari. It's the 458 Italia. Now, this is one of the fastest cars in the world. I've had an opportunity to sit in the passenger seat of this, and I can tell you it's scary when somebody drives you around. Because you are literally lying down on the floor. You know, and it feels like that. If you've been on a roller coaster, think much worse than that. Okay? It's just much worse. And especially when they start to go fast, you're like, stop. <laughs> you know, it's, it is, and it costs about $260,000 in the US. By the time you bring it to India, pro assume co close to a million dollars, right? It's a pretty fast car. Look at those numbers. You can only see two people. No baggage, nothing. Okay? There's, a, there's just no space in this car for anything else. Next. So what is this? This is the Tesla. This is the Tesla Model S. And look at its speed. You know, it can go 0 to 100 in 5.2 seconds, 5.6. And guess what the new Tesla can do? The new Tesla can do it in 3.2 seconds. OK? And look at it. It can seat five adults. And I'll show you the inside now, next. But look at the price point. That's what's amazing. This is also now, you know, in Silicon Valley and in Wall Street, whenever somebody made a big bonus, uh, the myth was they'd go to the Ferrari dealer and buy a Ferrari. Okay, and, and you know, part of it is actually reality. People would do it. But now, people go out and line up for the Tesla, the new Tesla. Let me show you the inside. So it's a big sedan. It's pretty uh, comfortable inside. Next. It's got a full touch screen, right? It's completely touch screen on the inside. Next. There's a boot. Pretty big boot, right? Next. And guess what? There's a boot on the front. How did they manage that? The look at the top. It's completely glass on the top. You can go Google it yourself. This is the strongest car made in the United States. And, this is, and the United States makes some big cars, some big, really big cars. And they, what they do is they take the car, take it up to 20 feet, they turn it upside down, and they drop it. It's called the drop test. And then they put dummies inside the car that drop upside down. And then they measure how, much they, how likely they are to survive. And this is the car in which they survive the most, even compared to some of the big SUVs, cars that are bigger than the Innova, right? Last, next. That's the car. Look, there's the wheels. Can you see the engine? It's between the back wheels. Do you know where the fuel tank is? It's between the wheels. That's the chassis. That's the entire car. And so for me, I'm inspired by this design. And you know, this, this cars have been around now for a, a century. So out of nowhere, somebody comes and redefines the car. But what, what do they do? They redefine the car on the inside. But from a consumer point of view, the car that they designed is exactly the same as the old car. It has a steering wheel. You know, when I talked to the guys at Tesla in the last May, they said we put a steering wheel only because otherwise people would have accidents. We put a pedal only because otherwise they wouldn't know how to repress a button to go faster and another button to brake. So they said we put pedals for that reason. Otherwise, the car's completely fly by wire. It's totally digital, right? And that's the beauty of it. It's not just that it goes fast. It's not just that it's battery operated. It's that somebody thought about something that was every omnipresent cars that have been around forever and rethought it completely but delivered it in a package that is so familiar that it's irresistible, right? That's the key. Next. Second, audacious goals. So the first was design. So think design. Think out of the box. The next is think big. And let me show you an example of somebody thinking big. Next. So this is a bridge in China. And this is the way they build bridges in China. Okay? This is a big city in China. 
that needed to have a bridge built over the bullet train tracks. You'll see the bullet train there. There are seven bullet train tracks that they needed to build a bridge on top of. Next. So what they did was they built a swivel because somebody gave instructions to the project manager that the bullet trains could not be stopped for even five seconds during the construction of this bridge. At no point could the bullet trains be stopped. That was the instruction. Because they connect two of the biggest cities in China. There are seven lines. They travel at 450 kilometers an hour under this bridge. And they said they will not even stop it for one second. That was the instruction given. So the team built the swivel. And they swiveled it while the, while the trains are flying in 29 minutes. 17,000 tons like a swivel was swiveled in place to build this bridge. So they built the bridge on the side of the tracks and then swiveled it into place to achieve this objective. Next. You see the bullet trains? This is as the bridge is swiveling. Obviously, all the TV channels in China were going with this live, you know, and they were watching it. And, you know, I don't know that I would have wanted to take the responsibility of this swiveling for the first time. They didn't have any practice run, nothing. It was all done in software simulation. And then they just had to swivel it into place.